Hello. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, yes, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the wonderful conference and for inviting me. And if I may add for the amazing food. So today, I would like to talk about limit periods and an arithmetic interpretation of it uh, corrected by also combinatorics. Uh, I cannot promise combinatorics, uh, but I will try to get to that. This is the final ingredient. <clears throat> so what we are after, uh, the, the main subject is limit period. So uh, let me set that up. We're going to have family curves and it's simple so it's going to be over a complex disk and here are some of the properties of this family first of all i didn't write it but it's, as usual it's going to be proper flat family and then my fibers uh, are smooth proper for T not zero. And so T equals to zero is going to be the singular fiber, hence this is the degeneration, uh, X zero, that's the zero fiber, is irreducible with a single node. And the degeneration to this node is simple. Essentially, I'm talking about the simplest possible degeneration one could cook up without being completely trivial. And for later purpose, we can also draw some pictures. My XT looks a little bit like this, and it degenerates to X0. And topologically, this is an accurate picture. So the genus can be higher, but one of the arms always shrink to a node. You can arrange for this to happen. So that would be my X zero. Um, now that I've defined X zero, uh, there's another, I mean, I can recreate X zero using smooth curves. So I will do this. I normalize. Now I have smooth curve of genus one lower and two marked points. Let's call them P and Q. So if I were to glue these two points, I get X zero and recover the central fiber. <clears throat> so let me write this C is the normalization. X zero and PQ in C map to the node. Now what's interesting when you have uh, singularities I mean, not in general, especially depending on the degeneration, but in odd dimensions, whenever you have such a nodal degeneration, is that uh, the periods on XT, uh, they, do not, they, they do not specialize continuously at T equals zero, but uh, some of them blow up. There is in particular one problematic loop. And so let's call this maybe alpha. So this is the loop that passes through the node in a special fiber. And here it will give me a path connecting T and Q. Now, again, just for our amusement, we can say the following. I will, I will give an alternative description of this, but it's nice to have a somewhat explicit description of what's, uh, what's the problem here, uh, why it's not immediately trivial what's happening. You have holomorphic forms here. One of the holomorphic forms on XT will specialize to something that lifts to a metamorphic form in C. So a hollow form, not all, but one of the holomorphic forms uh, on X T, let's say, let's say X eta T specializes to a metamorphic form eta on C. So it's, uh, it's going to be a fiber of the relative dualizing sheaf, uh, uh, and that can be identified with metamorphic forms. <clears throat> so we can change. Uh, I can determine what eta looks like and then choose eta t. But anyway, so the upshot is if you were to compute this integral, this is an, this blows up and it blows up uh, not in a kind way. 
So if it was blowing up metamorphically, let's say, as a function of a metamorphic function of T, then maybe I could take some kind of projective limit and so on, and then this would not be so interesting. So what makes this story interesting is that it has a logarithmic expansion, and then there's a constant here, and then there's something that goes to zero. Now, uh, you see the problem is, of course, physicists do, do this all the time. Divergent integrals never stop the physicist. And you just write down an asympto asymptotic expansion. You kill all the terms that blow up and take the constant term, and they say, this is what nature intended. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, there's a theory of limit mixed Hodge structures. And this is, it's, it's defined in a super fancy way, but that's what it is, that you take a logarithmic expansion, kill all the logarithms, read the constant terms. Um, but the problem is, what if I, my parameter is, was 5t as opposed to t? Then, of course, it would look like this. And now my new constant has changed. That means the constant term in an asymptotic expansion is dependent on what I've chosen as my coordinate. Therefore, to define limits, I actually need to fix a rate, an infinitesimal rate of approaching the origin. If you fix this, then your limits are well uh, So let's say if you had a t in mind, then take the differential at t. Otherwise, you fix just an element, the differential at zero, the disk. And your limits are well defined. So this gives, so for any T non-zero, uh, the periods specialize holomorphically, and you just, the, the periods determine the Hodge structure on uh, XT, on homology of XT. So here, what they determine after you read the constant terms is that it still determines something and it gives you a mixed Hodge structure, uh, what's called a limit mixed Hodge structure. which um, I will write as L psi. And I write this as the limit, but of course it's a fancy limit where I take an asymptotic uh, expansion and read of the constant terms. Of my periods determines the limit mixed structure. Good. Now, uh, I mean, you might be surprised a little bit why I'm doing this baby case. <clears throat> And you think you'll I'll start doing something serious, and this was just a precursor to it. But in fact, um, this super simple thing uh, has not been properly uh, analyzed in the sense that one, one sort of uh, technological item was missing. And I'll point this out to you. So our goal is to uh, understand, interpret, maybe I should say, interpret L psi from the point of view of the central fiber and in particular of this triplet CPQ. Now this sort of thing is called, I mean, this subject of interpreting limit mixed Hodge structures from the point of view of central fiber is called asymptotic Hodge theory. Um, now the subject has uh, progressed and well, I mean, even in the seventies, we knew uh, almost everything there is to know about this limit. And I will now tell you what uh, we knew and what was missing. Hmm. Okay, first of all, um, the, the limit mixed Hodge structure, this is called um, by extension type. Um, with central piece. the H1 of C. So what that means is I mean, there's a topological, so topologically determined weight filtration on L psi and the graded pieces are, well, we can write it like this. So there's 
a simple piece that doesn't seem to be doing anything, H1 of C, and then another simple piece. So this is all uh, determined topologically. I won't uh, draw these pictures, but you see, for example, H1 of C, if I take in loops around these two uh, donut holes, they seem to specialize and give me uh, loops at this donut hole. That's essentially the explanation for the presence of H1. Um, I can take a loop around P that gives me a loop around one of the arms here. Uh, that explains, well, depending on homology or cohomology, uh, one of these pieces. And that path explains the other piece. So there, so there are two kind of special loops here. The one that P would normally contract, and this path would not appear in the cohomology of C. And they, those are the two special paths. Um, <clears throat> so what this already tells me is that even if I ignore uh, the extension itself and just read of the pieces, uh, the piece, the middle piece, So the periods here determine the curve C by Torelli. All right, so, so this is the kind of thing that we want to do. Uh, there are other pieces here, the extension periods. We want to understand what they mean. Um, the other pieces are also interpreted. So this, let's say um, I have the weight one piece gives me that extension over here. So now here I broke that extension, but normally that extension is present. And in fact, you can interpret what this means. So in this case, this will be the relative cohomology of C with respect to PQ. Similarly, the other extension is this one, so that it would give me that extension over there. Similarly, I just write down what the extension is. So this is now the uh, cohomology of the punctured curve C, and you have a residue map that gives constants here. <clears throat> well, okay, what do these mean? So the extensions, by the way, these, these two are dual. Uh, are dual extensions. And here, what they do is the following. So I, if I were to take the extensions of, uh, let's say, I guess I want to take this. This is the Jacobian. So the extensions of this H1 is isomorphic to the Jacobian of the curve. And right? in general, it's always, there's some Jacobian. Um, so when I, we talk about these extensions, really I'm talking about points on P uh, on the Jacobian of the curve and what could they be? So these extensions, so the two extensions I have, So they both go to the point, let me write the about Jacobi image of P minus Q in here. <clears throat> so what that means, again, something you can see, uh, the, the holomorphic forms that do not uh, have a pole in the limit, the holomorphic forms in the end will want to eventually integrate from a path from P to Q. And the integral of holomorphic forms on the curve C integrated from P to Q is the definition of the Abel Jacobi here, and that's one of the periods here. So that gives me the following. If, if C is not hyperelliptic, then in fact, the Abel Jacobi image P minus Q uh, determines both P and Q. All right, so that means the first piece, the, the graded pieces gave me C, the extensions gave me P and Q. Um, so L psi determines, we can assume it's not hyperelliptic, otherwise it's interesting information anyway, uh, determines C, P. Okay, this is, 
So we've gone up to 70s, basically. This was known uh, even then. But there's one, one other piece. So I have a by extension. So I've studied the pieces, the extensions, now the by extension. Uh, and the issue is that there is a one parameter family family of by extensions uh, over the two given extensions. So the, of course, the converse is true. If, if I have L chi, it determines CPQ, but otherwise if I have my family, uh, then I have CPQ and that determines the extension pieces. So I, thus far is everything is determined geometrically. So this last bit is to be understood. There's a by extension emerging these two extensions. And let's maybe borrowing future notation. These will be the by extensions of H1C. Uh, specializing for these two extensions. So by extensions that specialize P minus Q, P minus Q. Um, this thing is non-canonically, so non-canonically isomorphic to C star. So it's a C star torsor. And what we are now saying is what would be the meaning of this by extension? Everything else had a meaning. What is the meaning of this by extension? Um, now, although this is uh, nice, what's so it's a C star torsor, which means this identification is not canonical. So the corresponding number is not canonical, but there is something that's canonical, which I will talk later on. Uh, it's called the height of uh, L psi. And this lands canonically into the space of real numbers. It's uh, the obstruction splitting the corresponding real mixed noise structure. The obstruction space is canonically the reals. So now, I have something like this. And for our convenience, it's not so bad to say this is, if you do, do everything correctly, this height is essentially the real part of the constant of my asymptotic term here. It's this. What you need to do right is to make sure your form is specialized to an eta that has purely imaginary periods. I won't uh, mention this again. It's just, there's a way to express this psi purely as this uh, constant in an asymptotic expansion of an integral. Now you might also realize why this is an interesting question. This sort of integrals, of course, come up quite often in maybe more complicated degenerations. And uh, somehow you recognize zeta threes in your limits and you want to understand where they come from or to prove that they're zeta threes. And this is a, it's kind of a start. Oh no, this, this is really the goal of the talk. And now I was going to say the, what, what is known about this number. So I will talk about higher dimensions at the very end. <clears throat> Yes, I mean, it, it, this zeta three is not going to appear in this talk, except it's sort of one of the source of motivations that you you say observe numerically a zeta three. You want to be able to prove that it's zeta three, uh, and that would mean interpreting your periods from the point of view of the central fiber. <clears throat> okay, uh, so. What is the meaning of that uh, limit period, essentially, or the height of the by extension? So what we can actually go to literature, as I said, this is a heavily studied example, one of the simplest examples. Um, so let me get my quotation right. <clears throat>
So they have a book, um, well, Clemens, Müller, Stach, Peters, they have a book on uh, mixed dot structures called Period Mappings and Period Domains. Yes? Carlson, did I write it wrong? I think I even have it in. Thank you very much. So Carlson, Müller, Stach, Peters have a book called Period Mappings and Period Domains. And period domains. And in the introduction of this book, to get us warmed up, they consider this example and they write down the period matrix for this uh, by extension. They, they start interpreting the pieces just like I've done. They say this piece is Torelli, it determines C, this, these are extensions, they are the Abel Jacobi's of P minus P and so on. And then they come to this uh, value of star, the regularized period. Uh, and then they say, They have a different symbol for it, but they say the value of this number star has no significance. And this talk is about the significance of this number. But they have uh, a good argument, right? So they essentially prove uh, in some sense that this value cannot have any significance. Um, <clears throat> they say that well, as we've observed in this board that I just erased, unfortunately, um, that if you scale, so the argument is this, if you scale your rate of approaching to zero, psi, by lambda, then, well, psi changes by by log of lambda. And in particular, the height will change by the uh, log of absolute value of lambda. Uh, and since no psi is determined, I could have chosen any other psi. Um, and then that means, yes, no zero is allowed. So this is not zero. Otherwise, you, you cannot regularize as well. <clears throat> so, this means I have a number which I can, it's which it's well defined up to logarithms of complex numbers, which means it's completely undefined. It could have been any number. Yeah, so this star is has no cannot have any significance, or it just reflected your choice of psi. But one observation that we can make is, I mean, the statement implicitly has the following assumption that uh, no psi is distinguished. So if xi was distinguished, maybe this fact would change. Okay. So any questions thus far? So I'll uh, first then give our statements and then we will interpret it and refine the statement a little bit. Um, so essentially at the same time, we started the project and ended the project more or less at the same time with uh, Bainelson. So um, we are able to interpret this number now. And the only hypothesis you need is to say, uh, assume that the triplet CPQ is defined over a number field. Uh, number field K. <laughs> So then let me be vague for a few minutes. Then uh, there exists rational choices. So you want K rational choices for the rate of deformation for psi. And that's also already pretty good. So here I had an uncountable indeterminacy. Now I have countable indeterminacy. Uh, and for those, So 
for those choices we have here's the what I called was the height of L psi. So that's essentially a limit period or the real component of it. You arrange it correctly. Uh, this height is equivalent. Well, I have to deal with the K indeterminacy. So this is the weak form. We'll make it stronger later on. It's another height, it's, but that depends only on my data, the central fiber. It's the neuron tate height of P minus Q uh, modulo the logarithms of rational numbers. So it's actually, well, in, so the norms of your scaling uh, appears here. So it's, you, you end up with an indeterminacy of Q star. Now, I'm not going to define what a neuron tate height is, but let me just say that it's a measure of complexity. This is a measure of arithmetic complexity. This point P minus Q in the Jacobian, which can be embedded into some large uh, projective space. But it, it's, I mean, what you would know you could do is choose an embedding into projective space and then read off the coordinates of P minus Q. Uh, that is, uh, gives you some bounds on how complicated those would be, uh, but you have to do it you know, without choosing coordinates. And this is a canonical uh, kind of bound. Okay. Um, so what's key is that this depends only on my central data. I no longer even need the family. Of course, I need to sort out this indeterminacy at some point. <clears throat> so, uh, so there are, by the way, we did, did a slightly different things. So we make this formula precise. Then uh, later on, Bailenson essentially says that there exists such a formula. He, he does not give these formulas, but he says there exists such a formula for the kind of degenerations that give you by extensions. So then these are odd, odd dimensional degenerations with a nodal central fiber. So I'll come to that later on. Okay, good. <clears throat> I think our first order of business is to uh, fix the second sentence where I say that there exists k-rational choices for psi. So let's make, make that a little bit clear, and then we'll interpret this statement a little bit more conceptually. Um, well, remember that we had this, how much do I want to recall here? Okay, let's briefly recall since my symbols have disappeared. So I had my family X, and then here I had my nodal elements, which um, I normalized with C and I have P and Q here. Okay. <clears throat> so there's a rather easy lemma. So this is a baby form for Kodaira Spencer, but for singular uh, degenerations rather than smooth degenerations. Uh, there exists a canonical map. I'll denote by kappa. That sends differentials at the disk centered at the er uh, origin to something that relates to C. So it will send to this tensor product of differentials at P, tensor differentials at Q. 
And you see already what advantage this gives me. So if C P Q is defined over, let's say K, a number field in embedded, I think, let's take it embedded in complex numbers. If I have my data defined over there, then the right-hand side, right-hand side uh, has a K vector space inside. Namely, it's the vector space of K differentials, tensor K differentials. So I, So there's Q, so this is isomorphic to K, not non-canonically isomorphic to K, and this is in the right-hand side. So that means my rational choices, so Xi, let's say Xi is K rational. If Kappa Xi lands in this K vector state. Um, so, if we started with a base that was, uh, let's say, was a projective curve defined over k, for this much, we could have actually just taken um, the k differentials defined over your curve. That was a thing, and these two ideas would have matched. But I can do a little bit more, and maybe I'll do this uh, at the end. Uh, that I I can put put an integral structure. On the right hand side, side by choosing a model for C. And so this is a side remark, this won't be so important right now. But um, if you had a K, an integral structure here and an integral structure here, they don't typically match. So you really need to take the K structure that comes from here and then use Kodaira Spencer to uh, pull it back here. So really, this Rodaria Spencer is the right approach. Um, okay, so that explains what uh, differentials were taken. And now the goal is to interpret this a little bit more conceptually. This will also explain what uh, Balenson did and some of the implications of this, of this formula. Uh, and towards the end, I would like to give the correction track. That's a little bit combinatorial, even tropical in nature. <clears throat> well, we'll shift gears a little bit and talk about by extensions. So if there are questions, this is a good time to ask them. Okay, so uh, let's define by extensions in general. I mean, half generally. I, I will just talk about ex by extensions of H1. So a mix of code structure, B is a by extension. H1 of C. So here you can take any pure hot structure of odd weight. You just have to shift the weights. Uh, oops. Uh, the by extension of this, if the weight graded pieces of B are identified this data. <clears throat> so that this identification is part of your data. And you see, I have these two extensions that we discussed, and this is a by extension that extends the central piece into two directions. Uh, 
And so now we look at what kind of by extensions there could be, especially um, this is to interpret the existence in this relation between these two uh, meaningful numbers. Uh, that means some by extensions are essentially distinguished arithmetically, and we would like to explain what that could mean. So first, this is a theorem from the 90s. So Hain proved that the moduli space of by extensions canonically identified with the Poincare bundle, <clears throat> bundle over the Jacobian of the curve. So in general, there's some kind of uh, Poincare bundle over the uh, associated intermediate Jacobian, if you want. So that looks like the following. Let's make this precise or more explicit. So I have, let's say my, this would be my moduli of by extensions. And here I have Haynes isomorphism to the Poincare bundle. So the Poincare bundle comes with two projections to the Jacobian and in principle, the dual of the Jacobian. That's Jacobian is self dual here. And what we had, we have an analogous map here in D. Uh, my by extension consists of two extensions. So I could map here to the two X groups. I won't write down the, the X, so X of the central piece would set. And I've already mentioned that this is the standard that these extension groups are canonically identified with the Jacobians. Um, <clears throat> so it completes this picture that the Poincare bundle is the thing that sits over uh, this product. And my C star, I can explain to you the C star of a possible by extensions. For example, if I fix here P minus Q, P minus Q, uh, obviously the center of the fiber here. So this is a C star torso. It's isomorphic to C star, but not canonically. And of course, the same is true over here. So can you say that again? Oh, no. No, no, no. It's, in, in, it's possible that um, I, it's perfectly allowed and it happens that the two extensions are not self tool It's just that the one I'm interested in lives over this. Yes, so there are many, uh, many extensions and essentially almost all of them have been understood and studied except for the one that we're talking about right now. Um, oh, just, sorry, this is, I should have removed the zeros. <clears throat> So there's no canonical thing here, not even zero. Okay, um, maybe briefly I say here what height means. Very kind of strangely, I can tensor my mixed out structures over the reals or equivalently I forget the integral structure. Uh, what you get, again, this is if you want a side remark. So I, we, and then I would be talking about real by extensions. So it's exactly the same way, replace all the Zs with Rs. And this is a Haynes definition of height uh, because what happens is that the extension groups in this setting, this is zero. And this is, it becomes canonically isomorphic to R. And basically the map of Hain is defined in the following way. You take your by extension, you forget the underlying integral structure, and then you uh, evaluate this canonical isomorphism. This is the obstruction map to splitting the underlying real mixed heart structure, and that's called Hain's height. <clears throat> Okay, uh, so what I mentioned this Poincare bundle for a few reasons. Maybe I say this now. So if my 
triplet CPQ from before is defined over K again. Then in fact, whenever I take a K rational point of the Jacobian, my fibers will have a K structure. My fibers, I mean, the Poincare bundle will be defined over K. Uh, then the fiber, fiber of the Poincare bundle uh, admits a sub K star torso. So it was used to be C star, but there's a K star inside now. Um, so that distinguishes that distinguishes then a bunch of by extensions. Yeah. I have a K star torso uh, by extensions. And there's a theorem. Well, this is why Hain essentially did all this work. And um, is it if how would I put this again? So if you work with uh, by extensions defined over K, okay, in this sense, right, coming from the Poincare bundle, then uh, you're computing that on tape heights. The height computes neuron tape heights. And in particular, this, um, the height map on, on the K star torso uh, in, will evaluate to <clears throat> so to this set, the neuron tape height of T minus Q uh, mod I mean this is from the 90s. Uh, and basically reading this, you automatically would believe that therefore the height of our limit mixed height structure should be the neuron tape height. Therefore, it was uh, conjecturing. Uh, the statement that the height of the limit fixed height structure should be the neuron tape height um, is very believable. There's a problem, however, here. Hmm. So the so on the by extension side, uh, these let's call them K elements are without putting too a fine point on it, are uh, motivic in the sense that they relate to the cohomology of the curve C. So they all look like this. So here's the key restriction here. So if I have two divisors in the Jacobian, so these are clearly the points over here, then uh, the, the by extensions, you can uh, construct purely from C. Uh, you subtract from C the support of one of the divisors and then consider the relative cohomology with respect to the other divisor. This works only if the divisors are disjoint. And when the uh, divisors are not disjoint, then uh, this construction fails. You don't get uh, a by extension. Um, and our limit mixed hot structure certainly is not of this form. Uh, whenever you try to interpret it, you realize that you have to subtract T minus Q, you have to subtract PQ, and want to take the relative homology with respect to PQ. Of course, that doesn't, uh, that collapses. This relative thing doesn't give anything new. Um, What you would have to show is that somehow the limit mixed hot structure constructed in a very, very analytic way
ends up doing something that's geometric in nature, motivic if you want to call it. And the statement you want to prove or This is really rather a corollary of our work. We didn't approach it from this direction. So however you want to call it, this theorem or corollary. It says that uh, the, the map, which we constructed in the following way, I take a differential at the origin and I don't, I don't want to take a zero differential. Sorry, this is not too many. Okay, so differentials at zero minus it's the zero differential. And then I have, <clears throat> I have differentials at Q and minus zero. So that, remember this was an isomorphism. So this map um, maps the Hodaira Spencer uh, K star torsor on the left-hand side to the K star torsor on the right hand side. So if we had first proven this, then um, by Haynes' result, you would have gotten the other theorem that says um, our limit mix structures end up computing the neuron tate type. In this case, we've done the other one. We've gone the other way around. We computed the period is essentially the neuron tate type. And then we, I'm using Haynes' theorem to explain uh, this sort of conceptual interpretation. So what that means is that the limit mixed Hoyt structure can maybe be done so, however, this is Kind of well known that the limit mixed out structures with our current understanding cannot be done uh, over a number field. It's very analytic in nature. Uh, therefore, it's actually not known in general that your limit mixed out structures, if you've used information coming from a number field, would give uh, the corresponding sort of arithmetic data over on the right hand side. Um, <clears throat> so, this was also the, one of the motivations, and Balenson approached the theorem directly from this direction. So I should say Bainesson's theorem is that for by extensions, okay, so modulo constraints and uh, so let me say in this case, the L psi can be partially defined, constructed in the category of So in, the, in a category of uh, motives, uh, he almost constructs L psi, this limit mixed void structure. So he, he cannot define it, so it's, we don't know how to do this, but uh, he says this partial information is enough to compute the height. This partial information construction computes the height, or I should say determines the height. So his version would say that the
Thank you. Um, are there any quick questions, comments for the speaker? Currently, we don't currently have any questions. So let's thank. Oh, there's. I'm sorry, I didn't see. Yeah. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. We're going to take a picture. 